we go. <coughs> so, this is a forthcoming analysis by uh, Farbod Akloggy. I actually think I've read something. Or I've read stuff. I don't know if it was on stream by Farbod Akloggy before. I apologize how I say your name. Transformative experience and the right to revelatory autonomy. So, this, uh, I mean, if I had to guess, there's a whole thing about, like, transform transformative experience and like like if you if you like become a parent they say or like they argue that you could not fathom what it is to be a parent before you become a parent i don't know if that's true but people say look you the day before like when you become a parent like it changes how your life is going in a significant way that you could not have figured out ahead of time and so that's the uh, kind of the idea that's going into a lot of these papers that like you can do things like becoming a vampire apparently like you could it will change your body and then you'll have different abilities once you are a vampire from not being a vampire. And so you've got some sort of transformative experience. And then in some sense, you have a different life or body. So you can have a experience of like some sort of revelation of a right to be able to change your life. So let's see what this is. But that's what it looks like just from the title. Now from the title, I don't know what it is, but like it looks like... um these are just guesses from what I know that they're arguing that this right is something new that not only can you have a transformative experience but you have a right to be able to do so <coughs> so that's kind of new to say that you have the right to fuck up your life basically <laughs> in ways you don't understand <sighs> so as always let me know ask questions if you want I, as my first time reading it too feel free uh, and uh, here we go one introduction Transformative experiences raise difficult and much discussed questions regarding first personal rational choice and agency. But I argue focus upon these issues has left critical uh, has left crucial ethical questions regarding our behavior towards others who face transformative choices untouched. Here I ask under what conditions, if any, is it permissible to interfere with to try to prevent others from choosing to undergo a transformative experience? I argue that we possess a moral right to what I call revelatory autonomy, providing a conditional answer to this question that, unlike other views I shall consider, accommodates the epistemic peculiarities of transformative choices and lays a plausible groundwork for an ethics of transformative experiences. All right. so immediately, if I say, look, you're going to take this drug and it's going to change your life, man. You smoke this joint and you're never going to be the same. So basically, it's saying, look... Do we have a do we have to intervene against someone who doesn't know any better, or do you have a right to go and like smoke that joint and get your mind blown? Um, what is the uh ethical thing like here? Smoke this joint, dude, you just could blow your mind. Is there like there is an ethical question there? Like, what should we do? Should we prevent someone from doing like kids from doing this? Should we allow like adults to do this? Like, what exactly is it? So the question i call an experience epistemically transformative if and only if it provides some knowledge or understanding that one can possess only if one undergoes that experience like tasting a new fruit or seeing or first seeing a color and call an experience personally transformative just when it changes the core preferences values and desires of whom whoever undergoes them like starting a career taking a university course or reading moving literature a transformative experience is one that is both epistemically and personally transformative, such as becoming a parent, going to war, or studying at university. Yeah, and uh, the big person in this area is L.A. Paul, and this is, uh, I assume this is L.A. Paul's book that is being referenced here. I think of the same name, transformative experience. Transformative choices, choices whether to have transformative experiences raise difficult questions about first personal rational choice and agency for how could one make an informed choice whether to go to university if one can only know what it is like if one goes even if one could know what it would be like given that one will change if they go whose preferences matter in this whose preferences matter in this choice your present or your future preferences and since the experience will change who you are why should the outcomes of this experience for some other self be relevant to what you present your present self should do now yeah i mean this is the thing <coughs> exactly sorry about that but who exactly are you making decisions for is it going to be future noger or current noger if a uh, future noger uh goes like you know by some like has some crazy different life why should current 
no uh, make choices for that person. You don't know what that future person is going to, well, their life is like. Why, how can you actually have an informed decision about, like, your later self if you're assuming that, like, the decisions you make now will change your life to be a different sort of person in the future? So that's what it is. It's like, if you're going to go to university, like, change all the things you believe, then you can't really decide now what that other person's life is like. Okay. Author asks, but suppose that it is not you who faces the transformative choice, but instead your friend, sibling, your romantic partners. Such situations raise difficult ethical questions regarding our behavior towards others who face transformative choices. Consider 1. Love. Jack and Jill are childhood sweethearts. Jack hopes to spend his life in the, their village. Jill hopes to pursue a university education elsewhere. Jill receives a full scholarship to a university elsewhere. Jack considers trying to stop Jill from taking up the scholarship. All right, so now we, that was a love. Friendship. Shireen and Siavash are best friends. Siavash has a high-paying city job. Recently, Siavash has considered quitting this job to become a school teacher. Shireen considers trying to stop Siavash from doing so. All right, and family. Family. Adam is Charlie's brother. Adam is considering whether to become a parent. Charlie considers trying to stop Adam from doing so. All right, so those are the three things. We've got love, friendship, and family. The transformative experiences literature typically proceeds as if we are only ever in the position of Jill, Siavash, and Adam, but often we are in the position of Jack, Shireen, and Charlie, not ourselves facing a transformative choice, but in a position to influence another's transformative choice. Why might we do so? We may have self-interested reasons to stop others from making certain choices as Jack does in love. And sometimes without, without vested interests, as in friendship or family, it may simply be unclear what one may permissibly do when given the opportunity to affect another's transformative choice. Alright. I don't know about this. Already, it's looking like, look... You don't know what would happen to your life if you were the one making the choice. Why do you think you know something about somebody else? Sometimes you do. Sometimes you understand something about other people. And you can say, look, that would be a bad decision for you. Maybe you don't see it, but it's a bad decision. That is pretty rare that you can make that call. Um, now... Maybe not always. Maybe it's like if someone's taking on like a massive responsibility, like, you know, raising a kid and you know that person just is completely irresponsible. You don't know if they're going to change when they have the kid, but you can, some people, you can say, hey, look, everything else you've done, you've not changed. Why are you going to change now? But like, this is a very narrow case. Like any transformative choice, like, what do you know? little humility can go a long way on these things. Like, why are you telling other people what to do with themselves? <sighs> these questions concern crucial moments in our interactions with those we stand in special relations to. They present an urgent ethical challenge that focus upon first personal transformative decision making has left unexplored. To begin addressing them, I ask the question. The question is, under what conditions, if any, is it morally permissible to interfere fear with to try to prevent another from making a transformative choice yeah and what's the uh thing from star trek if anyone out there remembers the uh like some sort of a uh, imperative or whatever like you leave people alone this is like exactly what this sort of uh, cho uh question the big question here is it's like do you why can't you live near yeah, the prime direct thank you shane what's up shane how you doing yeah this seems like a very prime directive -y, uh sort of um discussion and how you doing, Shane? I hope uh, the end of the semester is going well for you. Uh, yeah, I was lurking your uh, Gundam stream the other day. <laughs> yeah, like, when can you really mess with someone else's life? Like, when would it be morally permissible to violate the Prime Directive and interfere with the evolution uh, or just the culture that you know you don't actually have anything to do with or you only have something as a friend but like you don't actually know uh, it's going well still too tired than i should be i'm saying i'm way too tired than i should be at the moment a lot nowadays it's not a happy thought okay author argues that three prima facie plausible answers to the question fail they seem attractive 
partly because they seem plausible as views of when we might permissibly interfere with another's in another's choice more generally. But these views fail, I argue, precisely because they concern transformative choices and experiences. I argue instead for an answer that recognizes a distinctive moral right, a corresponding duty, concerning transformative choices, laying the groundwork for an ethics of transformative experiences. Yet, yeah, like, this is the thing. When do you get to violate the Prime Directive? Like, really? It's not... Like, people, they do it all the time in the show. Or do, I don't know if they do it all the time in the show, but, like, you know, they do it once in a blue moon in the show for various reasons. Or the movies, I don't... I'm not a Trek person. I don't know. But, like, this seems exactly... When can you really go in and violate the Prime Directive? And we've got answers from the show. Like, what? when did they actually do it? So... But... It looks like the author is taking the position that we like meddling with other people's lives, which actually, you know, that's not a crazy position to take, that people like to mess with other people's lives. People like to give advice. They do. Um, there is something very interesting about advice in general. Um, why do we think we give advice well? Who gives advice well? Shane says, to stay in the metaphor, Spock would say that the means of the many must outweigh the means of the few. Yeah, and that's the thing. Like, if someone's going to do something and it's really going to fuck up the world, maybe we should tell them, hey, maybe don't push that, like, nuclear bomb button. That would be a bad thing. That will change your life if, like, half the world gets blown up and, like, lots of people are going to die. Maybe you shouldn't do that. Like, I can see Spock's perspective there. But if, like, you're only really messing up your life, which is quite often what's happening if you're like going to take on a new job quit your job something like that it's not going to really be um going beyond you, what you're doing it gets a lot harder and i mean like spock then would you know what spock said there is that d wouldn't apply so it's like yeah are you going to like you know adopt a kid that would be a big change in many people's lives and you know worse comes to worse you'll mess up the kid's life but you know you're not pro maybe not like you know but in the grand scheme of things that's hard because you don't know what's going to happen at that point. But it's not the many. It's just, you know, a few people. All right. Author says there are numerous forms of interference in another's decision making. For example, Charlie might coerce, manipulate, rationally persuade, or force Adam not to become a parent. And what follows, interference refers to any of these. Okay, so any, you know, molestation of someone when making a decision is what is, is interference. What is required to permit such interventions may, of course, differ, but I will argue that the distinctive moral right we possess concerning transformative choices places a necessary condition on all such interference and provides the best framework from which to make tractable other to make tractable other questions regarding the interpersonal ethics of transformative experiences. All right. All right. Three. The right to, to revelatory autonomy. And I mean. This already sounds like the right position, that we have a right to go learn things that we didn't know in the past. But, like, it's a epistemic right, almost. Like, we have a right to, you know, be a better person, even if we weren't in the past. And do we have the right to be a worse person, also? Kind of. And that's the hard question here, though. All right. <clears throat> Transformative experiences differ in valence. They can be positively or negatively transformative. Shane says, should that just be better titled The Right to Fuck Around and Find Out? Well, that's what I was saying before. It's like, how, like, do you have a right to go, like, take some drugs? Like, we kind of think you do, but it's like, you're going to fuck around. You might get high, but you might also, you know, hurt yourself. It's like the right to fuck around and find out. I think that's a good way to put it. Um, it's like, yo, smoke this joint, man. It's going to blow your mind. Like, should we stop a kid from smoking a joint? Yeah, maybe. Should we stop an adult from smoking a joint? Who's to say in some sense? Like, it's not going to kill them, most likely. It's like, but like, then again, going outside is dangerous, too. It's like, don't go outside. It's scary. It's like, eh. Well, you fuck around and then you find out. That's right. Yeah. So there is a positive and negatively tran can transform. Positive epistemic transformative experiences increase our knowledge or understanding and negative ones decrease them positive personal transformative experiences change who we are for the better morally or prudentially and negative ones change us for the worse this is always hard who the fuck knows what this actually is people like to say this in retrospect like oh yeah that was great or that was bad but no one actually knows until hindsight 
And so this is always a very difficult thing to say what is going to actually work out for you. So, uh, <laughs> yeah, I'm having a little trouble reading this. I'll say that at the moment. We're just getting into it. Um, I'm not loving this um, prose. It happens in philosophy. They're good at certain things, and they're less good at making nice prose. <laughs> All right, continuing. Perhaps then we may permissibly interfere with another's transformative choice just when that experience will be a negatively, epistemically, or personally transformative experience. For example, if Adam's becoming a parent were to make him worse off epistemically or personally, then Charlie may permissibly try to dissuade Adam from doing so. Yeah, if you know someone that would be a terrible parent and they're like dead set on becoming a parent, you're like, dude, just slow down. Like, I can see that happening. That's pretty... Uh people do this Shane says hypothetically if I'm utterly convinced in something that is objectively wrong becoming confused about that is a positive experience not a negative one yeah this is yeah like if there's going to be nuance here that this author isn't actually going for they're just trying to say in the I think they're not like you're right but I think what they're saying is look can we start to mess with people that are in like the wrong here like, do we have a moral right to, like, say, hey, look, you, you might want to rethink that, uh, you know, blowing up the world is a good idea. <clears throat> There's an old joke. Um, many problems, one solution. Blow up the moon. Because if we blew up the moon, all the other problems, you know, would seemingly go away. But it's like, is that really a solution? Well, it, it would, in some sense, solve all the other problems. And then we just have new ones. But like, yeah, if we blow up the moon, we wouldn't have to worry about certain things. Maybe like, yeah, get becoming confused about that, like epistemically getting worse off about something you thought was knowledge. Again, that would be a good thing, as Shane says. But basically, when can we mess with somebody is really uh, what the author is going for here. Shane says, I think we have a right. I think that at times it borderlines on an imperative. But I, but I'm an, uh, you, you know it all, asshole. Yeah. Um. It would have to be really like an obvious thing when we have to say, look, just stop. Like you have to just be like someone to stop. Um, I mean, you're talking to another know-it-all asshole. I mean, look what I do. But um, there's also the other time. There's also the other thing is y y they're going to fuck around. They're going to find out. You can just let it happen. It's the old uh, Greek theory. It's where you're not actively killing someone. You're just letting them wander off into the wilderness with no water. Um, so, like, there's more than one way to skin a cat. <laughs> it's like, yeah, you can go right ahead. You can go. I'm just going to, like, don't interfere with your enemy when they're making mistakes. So, like, there's more than one way to, like, let them fuck around and find out. Um, but, yeah. So sometimes it's bad, but like sometimes you have to bite the bullet too and just be like, yeah, you're going to find out. Um, now the question is how bad does it have to get before you do interfere? I don't know. But yeah, I'm mostly for letting people find out. But again, nowadays things are so hard because there's a lot of shitty people out there and they get away with so much stuff and I assume it's always been that way but we can see it now and it just it feels bad <laughs> Chances says oh for sure there's a lot can be learned by fucking something up and let people walk into it all yeah and you let people walk into it all the time yeah exactly it's like you, you, when do we when do we get to uh, fuck around in the world though and that's a good question. When do we get to fuck around in the world? Um, I mean, for the very short time that I was in a grad school, I was a TA in a, you know, like intro to philosophy course. And uh, I mean, I, I do a little epistemology. I know like better than some other things. And uh, I was going over something called the Gettier problem. If there's any philosophers out there, you know exactly what it is. It's a very, very famous thing that undermines the justified true belief theory of knowledge, which is in some sense kind of accepted in you know society somehow what knowledge is is you have a belief it's justified that you have it like you have good reasons and it's true 
and that's what knowledge is. It's justified true belief. You know it. No, no. You believe it. You have good reasons. It's a justified thing, and it happens to be true. Um, Gettier blew that up with a little bit of logical trickery. Um, but, like, it just basically shows that you can be lucky. You can be right for the wrong reasons or wrong for the right reasons. And, like, that's happens every day. Right for the wrong means, reasons or... Uh, wrong for the right reasons like you might go into something for all the right reasons and still be wrong and you know in the middle of class of my uh, ta section this kid just starts screaming this can't be right this has to be wrong this has to be wrong so i fucked that poor kid's head up somewhat bad that day and you know it's like okay he had a small transformative experience that day he um realized what he thought was knowledge could not be knowledge it just can't be justified true belief there is nothing wrong with Gettier's arguments it just does not justify true belief and now do i feel bad that i in some sense walked that kid right into a transformative experience that he was not expecting or prepared to do granted he was in college he had somewhat signed himself up for this shit but like <laughs> i was thinking afterwards what the fuck did i do to that poor kid today like just have him like break out screaming in class um, <laughs> I don't know, but like, these are the dangers of like, you know, like Shane's a teacher. Um, like I've got other people here that are academics. It's like, these are the dangers. You will fuck up kids heads. Like, whoops. So like, but what right do I have to do that to somebody else? <laughs> Granted, like I said, if you're in school, you did sign up for it, but still, he says, I remember that, that poor kid, like in the middle of class, just like start yelling. Like, oh, so I can assure you. No, and I, I, I will, like, give myself a little pat on the back. It took a lot of self-control to just say, no, this is right. I said, and why do you say that this is wrong? And he was like, ah, ah, ooh, ah. He, could, he had no answer, but, uh, <laughs> I was like, I can assure you, people are, like, arguing over this, but we're pretty sure this is right. Justified true belief fails. Uh. Anyhow, I'll we'll continue. We can con keep asking questions if you want, though, of course. Author says, The problem, however, is that this view ignores that there are paradigmatic cases of transformative experiences where we do not know nor have good reason to believe that they will be positive or negative until after they have happened. Vipers, hi. We're reading something about the right to go fuck around and find out. It's called transformative experience and the right to revelatory autonomy. So basically, do you have a right to go do stupid shit and find out the consequences that you did not know was going to happen? And, you know, Shane was here saying, look, sometimes we have to stop people because they just don't know how bad trouble they're going to get in. And I'm kind of on the like, you're allowed to go mess with people. But do they have a right to go fuck around and find out? Um, and so we're just getting there. This is still like early, uh, early in the paper. But this is the question, like, how much can you interfere with someone else's life when they don't know the trouble they're getting themselves into? <clears throat> Shane says, when I can tell they're... What the fuck? Okay. Yeah, that was interesting. That has not happened in a bit. My uh, stream deck crashed. Let's see what happens. Maybe it'll come back. Shane says, when I... When I can tell that they are arguing something badly, I will just stop them and point out the fallacy. No point in wrecking their world if they aren't even building their world the right way. I'm not going to knock down their house, but I will steal their hammer and nails. Um, yeah. Let's see. Can I fix this? Let's uh, try. Yeah, see, I think we're just in different positions. I'm not teaching school. So whenever I'm dealing with people like this, it's in like a non-academic setting usually. When I'm in an academic setting, I'm actually much nicer than I am um, when I'm than I am outside. When I'm like outside an academic setting and someone's being a dickhead, I don't feel bad in the least about a lot of stuff. Um, so let's see. Maybe this will work. Maybe this won't. We'll find out. So, like, I've told this story before, but, like, this guy was basically abusing his position. There was this very cute college girl working the register at this coffee shop I uh, was going to, getting breakfast one day, many years ago. And, you know, I, I'm older than I look, and I've always been older than I look. I'm, I look young. 
Vipers, why are you doing shaders? Like, really, what sort of graphics programming are you doing? Like, that you have to... I, I know what shaders mean. Like, why are you doing shaders? Like, okay. But yes, okay. That's a rabbit hole on its own. So, there's this guy, and let me just break it down for you. We're in a ritzy area of Brooklyn. She is a black good looking you know college girl and there is this basically neck beard maybe 40 something guy standing next to the rec uh, register she can't move she is like um like she that's her job and like he's trying to talk to her and she has a tattoo of a golden snitch on her shoulder so she's a harry potter fan and he is basically berating her for liking harry potter so this is the setup and I'm like, I'm waiting to get my coffee and my fucking muffin or whatever. And he's just not leaving her alone. She's obviously trying to discuss Harry Potter in between the work and defend Harry Potter from this guy who he knows what he's doing. He's kind of like beating up on Harry Potter because he can, he knows what he's doing. And you know, he's, I don't know if he's trying to show off to the girl or something, but it's not landing. Like she's not happy and he doesn't seem to get it or whatever. Not because it is easy, but because it is hard. This is why we do these things. Yes, Vipers. Okay. Yeah. So, I can't remember exactly what happened, but I fuck up his argument so badly that, like, basically, he, like, his argument impaled himself. Like, I just made him... What, everything he was saying, I turned it around on him. This is rare. But, like, you know, I was so pleased with myself. It, like, the opportunity presented myself. I fucked that guy up bad in terms of argument. And, um, <laughs> did we think Vipers wasn't a masochist? <laughs> but, um, <clears throat> yeah. And so this is the thing. It's like, do I have a right to fuck up with that guy's little bit of happiness that day? It's like, yeah. Um, but like he was making a bad argument, but like, why was he making a bad argument? He was making a bad argument because he was a shitty person. And he deserved to be slapped around because he was a shitty person and he was abusing the position where he could, you know, not that girl was trapped where she was because it was her job to be there at that register. <laughs> and so the one few times I've been able to just like put some smack down, like philosophically speaking, I did it. And like, you know, he just what happened was he started talking and tried to like, you know, readjust his argument and fix. And he realized there was no readjusting. He couldn't get out of it. He just started to, like, he, he, it was one of these, he started talking, and he got quieter and quieter, and he just trailed off, and he just started staring at me, because he, he completely lost. And he just turned around, and he walked out. <laughs> it's like, I was like, bye. On the upside, she gave me my food for free. So that was cool. But, like, when do you have a right to do this? It's like, you're, you're, you're saying, like, when, you know when they're arguing something badly and they are just doing it, yeah, you can stop them and point out the fallacy, but that's when you're arguing in good faith. I'm dealing with people in, that are not arguing in good faith, and I'm sure you aren't too. I'm not saying you aren't. But, uh, it's like, I know there's a lot of people not arguing in good faith. And so in some sense, fuck their bad faith. You know, fuck them. That's not what, like, needs to be happening here. It's like pointing out the fallacy is not the right thing to do. Beat them over the head with their fallacy is the right thing to do anyway yeah uh, you're gonna have made your brain melt out of your ears like yeah shader programming is I don't I have been looking at it myself very briefly I don't know anything but yeah anyhow <sighs> yeah so here's the thing when do you get to make that decision about changing someone's life when people are arguing in bad faith, fuck them. And then you can do whatever you want because they already uh, gave up the moral high ground. Here, the question here again is when people don't know any better and like there's ignorance here, then what do you have to do? Like then you're taking responsibility for both of you and that's different. So you don't know what's going to happen until after it happens. Like will someone step up to being a parent or are they just going to be a shitty parent? And you really don't know. All right, so the author says, becoming a parent, for example, is a positive, positive personal transformative experience for some and not others, like those who learn they are emotionally incapable of good parenting. This epistemic barrier, characteristic of some paradigmatic transformative experiences, makes it, makes it 
is impl makes it implausible to think that permissible interference generally depends on no upon knowledge or reasons for belief one cannot possess before that choice is made. Yeah, Shane says, in, in the class, I always stay in good faith, even if they leave in good faith. Yeah, there are ways to be imperious with good faith in such a way that they realize they cannot continue the discussion without appearing like an ass in front of their peers. I weaponize social pressure quite a bit in good faith. Yeah, that's the thing. Like, you have to use that stuff in class because you are trying to do good by the people. But, like, yeah, in class, people are, I guess, trying to learn most of the time. So, yeah. But, like, you have to use whatever rhetorical methods you have available to you. Viper says, I think I ruined a friendship this week. An American friend and C pulled out the old, most of the USA's so society ills are caused by the breakdown of the nuclear family. I destroyed the argument with data. She hasn't spoken to me since. Ooh. Yeah, sometimes you be, gotta be like, you gotta know that like, they may be wrong, but that might not be the best thing to, might not be the best thing to say. It's the old uh, Craig Ferguson line. Does this need to be said? Does this need to be said by me? Does this need to be said by me right now? If the answer to all three of those is not yes, then you can find a better way to do it. But, um, yeah. <laughs> it's like, that's one of those, hey, maybe there are other reasons than the breakdown of the nuclear family, and we can decide, we can talk about that some more. <laughs> but, yeah. Um, sorry to hear you lost a friendship. And hopefully, person will, you know, come back and be like, hey, look. We can disagree, agree to disagree on this or, you know, something like that. Yeah, this is the thing. The rhetoric is um, not what people think it is. You, arguing is a lot more about rhetoric than being right. So, being right quite often is very, very weak in terms of uh, what it does in the world. It's like, how, what can you actually argue for, though, in a way that, you know, gets you the outcome you want? So, I mean, that's actually one of the things about philosophy roulette. I'm always trying to say, well, what is the author's point here? And a lot of times they are technically right. But who gives a fuck? They don't like what are they trying to accomplish? It's like being technically right. It's not worth a whole lot. It's like technically right is, yeah, what best right. But like in a very, very small corner of the world, is that like the only the only important thing? All right. Author says, of course, a third party can be in a slightly different epistemic position than a transformative chooser. If Charlie has experience holding his baby child, then may then he may be in a better position to know what holding one's baby's one's baby in general is like than Adam. But there is no reason to think that what it is like for Charlie to hold his his child is the same as what it would be like for Adam to hold his Adam's child. That is while that is whilst holding your baby child is a, a type of experience that is generally personally transformative and generates new phenomenological information it is not always transformative in the same way or creates the same new information viper says without going too far down the tangent i've noticed so many americans use uh only use cherry-picked us data to support their argument never considering global data uh and shane says it it's because the u.s is the only country that matters duh yeah uh, what shane said Let's see, is this working? Hey, something might be working. We'll see. Yeah, um, I mean, the U.S. in terms of our rhetoric is always, um, you know, it, it, I think in some sense we quite often have the, you know, the first person, like, uh, you know, perspective, not the first person, the uh, rugged individualist perspective. And that's going to be from, like, you know, the U.S. perspective always. And so that whole sort of even cultural viewpoint gets, you know, translated into how people argue and think about their arguments. And so that's why many Americans are not looking at the global thing. It's because, you know, this is how things are and how I see it, this rugged individualism. The individualism translates into a non-global perspective. And that's uh, unfortunate. We're not looking at society. We're looking at, like, what we can see ourselves. And uh, so... I agree with you, Vipers. That is a lot of how our discussion is framed here, and it's not good. All right. Author says, 
for Liz Barnes, for as Liz Barnes puts it, all the different experiences that will have led up to the experiences and all the differences in the two people who are the subjects of the experience make this unlikely. Given Charlie's history and constitution prior to holding his child, his doing so may invoke joy and deep unconditional love. Adam alternatively may, given his history and constitution, come to feel deep fear, regret, and resentment when doing so. Parenthood can, can thus also be generally transformative without being so in the same ways for everyone. Given the variation in the experiences that led up to the transformative experiences and the differences in subjects, the point generalizes. We cannot know the value of such experiences for individuals in many paradigmatic cases. Yeah, I mean, so my experiences ain't gonna be the same as your experiences, fine. Should we thus conclude that we may never permissibly interfere in a transformative choice because we cannot have knowledge of what it would be like for someone at the time of their decision making? This is too quick. For suppose someone wished to have the transform transformative experience of going on a killing spree or to cut off their body from their waist down. Regardless of not knowing what this will be like for them, we clearly are permitted to prevent them from making these choices. So there, are, so there are no conditions is not a pl plausible answer to the question. Shane says, the U.S. is a statistical nightmare. Our demographics refuse to line up nationwide. We are too big and too varied. This does make some of our statistics difficult to compare to other countries at times. Broadly speaking, I'm not sure there are such homogeneous things as Americans. Yeah, I completely agree with that. One of the things that was funny was I know a bunch of like, you know, academics around here. And a lot of them are, you know, not from here because they're academics. You know, they're from like Europe or Australia, English speaking places generally, but not necessarily. And so I saw a bunch of tourists on the street. Why do I have a mohawk? That's weird. I don't do that. But fine. Um, and I called them. Hey, I go, look, there's some Americans over there. And they were like, you don't consider yourself American? I was like, I do consider myself American. But like, those are the real Americans. Because they were like, obviously, Midwesterners. I was like, that's unfair. But like, it was just like, I'm like saying, the people from New York are vastly different from the people in some other parts of uh, the country, which is not what you can say about a lot of other countries. Um, can't that be said about any group of any size based on the point you're trying to make? I think it might just be a sort of like, yes, but it's a semantic thing too. People use like American to talk about a lot of people. And so there's a semantic problem. Like when, if I say someone's from like Ireland, that's a smaller p place. Now, of course you're going to have statistical problems, um, th comparing different places in like Ireland, but like comparing like Maine people to like Florida people to like, uh, Texas people, like these are, yeah, it's like, that's the thing. Yeah. Like uh, the semantics are different because you're talking about a completely different sort of group of people and a different thing. It's like a mishmash in America versus a somewhat uh, less of a mishmash in other places. And so the idea of like the state in this, like the state as the United States is a like a political state, it's not really got the same history. And it's not, and then Shane says, it's not a homogeneous term like a, uh, it is like states are in other places, like what you call the French. <coughs> yeah, this country is very, very varied, and I don't think it's the same as uh, it's hard to compare it to other places. Uh, Shane says, culturally, ethnically, religiously, the French people are closer to uniform continuum than the uh, U.S. is. Sweden, further still, yeah. I mean, if anything, the U.S. is, I would assume it's more like, you know the entire European un Union where you've got like very different people in different countries um, probably less so but yeah I feel like more like the European Union determined by population size geographic scale or American exceptionalism I think it's a historical uh, thing here Vipers where we just have um, a very varied history um yeah, I mean, Americans more would be more compared to the Chinese or Indians because those are huge places with very different people in them. But compared to, like, the French, I think, no. Because, like, India is, like, you know, a billion people. And so you have very different things from one side of the country to another. But, like, you can't... It'd be harder to compare Americans to, like, you know, the French. You can compare Americans... Like, America more like to China. But, like, the Chinese, of course, you've got, like, different cultures within China and so you could talk about different populations in China more compared to certain populations in the US but like again 
it's harder to line these things up. Uh, yeah, I think it's more of a cultural thing. All right. <sighs> Continuing anyway, a second view then. It is permissible to interfere with another's transformative choice just when it is in the best interests of that person for you to do so. For example, suppose Shireen knows that Sivash has expensive tastes that will likely not be met if he became a teacher, and that Sivash would have fewer opportunities to see his current workmates if he changed jobs. These seem like good grounds upon which to object to Sivash's transformative choice. I mean, this is coming down to, can we ever tell anybody anything about their life? And, um, yes. So, because you don't actually know what the transformative choice is. Lol, don't get into teaching. Yeah, well, th this is, um, preaching to the choir. I mean, this is a person, an academic, and is writing to other academics here. So, yeah. But, like, when do you get to interfere in other people's lives? Like, that's what this is, whole thing is coming down to. I don't see a whole lot more than that at the moment. Because what is different between interfering with someone's life normally versus when they're making a big decision? Why is this different? I'm not sure. All right, Shane is, I think, answering Vipers. The U.S. has cultural, ethnic, religious, lingu and linguistic differences. Geography plays a part in all of those. Population size is not that big of an issue. Large populations can be similar. Small populations can be diverse. Yeah. I mean, you just look at the neighborhoods in New York. Now, we're all New Yorkers, but, like, some people are very different from others. And they don't like each other. And then they get into fights. <laughs> Alright, so here's a third view. The permissibility of interference in a transformative choice is determined by standard decision theoretic procedures of determining what to do under conditions of uncertainty by calculating expected utilities. On this view, we calculate the expected consequences of choosing a transformative experience as opposed to not doing so. Then once we know which is most likely to maximize the expected utility for the chooser, we may either we may permissibly, permissibly intervene just when the choice will not maximize the expected utility and not otherwise. So Shane says, stop people from going on a killing spree. Yes, stop that. Stop them from chopping themselves in half. I don't think we can stop that. Um, yeah, no, I think that's fair. But the author here is just asking, can we advise them against it? This is like really weak. And this is why I just brought up, like, can't we always be talking to people about stuff? And I think the answer to that is yes. Now, do we have a moral imperative to straight up stop a killing spree? Yes. But like, you know, they, they're not even asking that. Can we just tell them um, that like, it's a bad idea and I think um advice wise it's like yeah we can tell them that uh so yeah but like this thing even just like you know becoming a parent can you advise someone against that it's like yeah and they're trying to say like you know it's harder to argue for this than you might think I don't think so because they're making uh I think a mountain out of a molehill here because all of our decisions add up to be like significant eventually and so we always think that we can tell people stuff. Now, of course, you got to, like, not be a bloody know-it-all and, like, be telling everybody everything. But, like, yeah, within reason. All right. Author says, though, the problems with both views are these. First, we can only know what the interests of the f future selves are and whether one's present interest will be fulfilled after a transformative choice has been made. Siavash, for example, might manage to retain his current friendships and afford his expensive tastes, and we do not know if future Siavash would wish this. Similarly, since the utilities associated with a transformative experience, such as Jill's going to university, partly depend on what it would be like for her, and since she can only know this after going, how could we know what the expected utility of her going to university is? Yeah, again, you can't tell what the future is, and so advising people is inherently a risky thing of limited information. What do we got here? Picture. Oh, <laughs> uh, dear. What is this? From 12th January 1973, it will no longer be legal. Whatever you do, don't. Don't be one of those people who makes doing for not doing or you could face a fine. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Vipers. Um, yeah, just don't do it. It's illegal now. <sighs> yeah, so this is the whole thing. In the face of not knowing the future, can you tell anybody anything? Yes, because we're not that stupid. All right. 
Like, we're, we're just not. You can, like, this is why we have history. This is why you can go hang out with Shane and find out what dumb things people have done in the past and be like, don't do those stupid fucking things. Or you can be like, you know, maybe that's not a bad idea. We haven't tried this in 400 years. Maybe you can do that. Like, this is why you have to look at <laughs> This goes back to Hume. Now, I don't know how much you know about Hume, Shane, but Hume, Hume was basically a historian and a philosopher. He spent a lot of time um, going, being a librarian for a while. Yeah, <laughs> yes, exactly, Shane. Every time we do this, people die. Probably don't do this again. Hume knew a lot about history. Um, he was, uh, I think he did like a history of England or something like that, uh, like a very big volume at the time. And uh, he said, look, there's only, and this is a problem for him, his philosophy said, look, you have to do two things when you make a decision. You look at the history, you look at what other people did, and then you also make a rational decision. You can't have it both ways in philosophy. You can't say, look, you have to decide independently, uh, atemporally, rationally based on what's available to you, or you have to look at what people have done in the past and decide based on that. But that this is going goes back to Hume. This has not been different from Hume. This is exactly what the author is arguing about here. One of these is the rational expected utilities. It's right there. And the other one is look at the history based on the person, the their tastes and shit. So we've got two things. And this is exactly the, the thing here. Yeah, you've read some of his stuff because he spends a decent amount of time contemplating concepts of self that played into sociology for you for you that's interesting that you you saw that stuff for that reason um hume was actually yeah he was a fascinating dude hume um needed to get paid he wasn't rich he needed to get paid and get paid for his writing and so he was writing these short papers that he could publish in magazines that were still reading today as good philosophy he started at 21 he started writing like important philosophy like immediately like he was like he might be like 20 20 23 i don't know his stuff is like it holds up it's good it's entertaining and like you can read it today and be like you know that's a smart fucking thing he said right there and it's like stupid as short and it's good and Hume was so old. No, he started writing such good philosophy so early that he is put in the previous generation of philosophers. He is put in like, you know, people who were old by the time he was 20. That's the generation of philosophers he's put in. But that's because he started writing good stuff immediately. Him and Jean-Jacques Rousseau are put are the exact same age. They were born the same year. Jean-Jacques Rousseau is treated as in the next generation of philosophy after Hume. And they're the same age. So like that, like he started writing interesting stuff immediately. He, uh, like I said, he wasn't an academic philosopher or whatever it was to be an academic philosopher at the time. He was like a librarian for a long time and he wrote some books and got like sort of got paid off his books. And then he did a lot of other stuff. And then like, he just was fun. He won, uh, who do you, who would in the history of philosophy would you like to hang out with on Phil papers? You know, where I get my papers from. They did a survey who in the history of philosophy would you want to hang out with? And by far and away it was Hume because he was like a good time to hang out with he was not your stodgy academic he was having a good time so and Jean-Jacques Rousseau was insane by the way but that's okay <laughs> yeah Viper says Scottish kilt surely genitalia make one's thinking sharper <laughs> he also wore a fun hat and I don't know why people uh you know are so like uh get all tied up like uh worked up about hume's hat but you can go find hume's hat and a lot of you can buy one now there's like replicas of hume's hat which is just sort of a funny hat all right so the author is still on this uh question if you don't know what the future is how do you make a decision author says these problems are serious by making the permissibility of inter in interference dependent on knowledge of or reasons for belief we cannot possess at the time of choosing both views first entail that we can never know or have good reason to believe that we can permissibly interfere in a transformative choice shane says his identity of self ideas are basically that we aren't one thing we're just a bundle bundle of senses and thoughts and because we can't observe ourselves without using those we can't really have a solid concept that we are individuals interesting uh I don't remember. See, I never did agency and I don't do sociology. So I, I may never have read that part. <laughs> so that's kind of cool stuff. Um, 
his philosophy of science basically says the world is kind of like this complex mosaic so it's like just all sorts of different pieces put together and like that's what we're looking at and so it's sort of a similar thing hey valpo how you doing hope you're doing well and end of semester is going well for you yeah so like that's it it sort of mirrors his concept of world too um in the sciences because like i said it's a complex mosaic so like if you just took like the my little corner here like this box i'm in and just like broke it into like color splotches that's kind of how we saw the world and then we're just putting it together in different ways <coughs> yeah um we are well we were just discussing hume for a second um i forget how we got to hume but uh, this author is basic this is a you, I'm sure you've heard this stuff. Um, this is an author talking about transformative experience and then what sort of uh, rights does that entail? So, like, do you have a right to, you know, fuck around and find out, as uh, Shane said earlier? Like, can we interfere with other people making decisions when we don't know the outcomes? Like, the transformative experience thing? Do you have a right to get yourself into a transformative experience that you don't know the uh, answers to? Like, what, what the rest of your life is going to be like, and no one will. And so... Um, yeah, it's the, uh, Laurie Paul stuff. This author is basically saying that, like, what are the limits to us allowing other people to interfere with you making, like, big decisions? Like, can I tell you that, um, can I tell you that, um, you shouldn't be a parent? Like, yeah, like, is that the sort of thing, like, I'm allowed to do? Or do you, do you have a right to be left alone when making that sort of decision? All right, so, and they just basically, oh, here's how we got on the Hume. They basically said the the basic Humean breakdown of how you make decisions. You look at the history, or you make a rational decision based on, like, expected outcomes. And they just did, the author just, like, rehearsed that sort of thing. So I was saying, look, there's nothing new here in this sort of decision, this decision procedure. You look at these two things. Uh, did you ever get any closer to translating FAFO? I don't know what FAFO is. What is FAFO? confused all right so yeah and so the author is saying well why can we can't really know what to do uh and if uh, the experience is transformative author says these problems are serious by making the permissibility of interference dependent upon knowledge or reasons for a belief we cannot possess at the time of choosing both views first entail that we can never know or have good reason to believe that we can permissibly interfere in a transformative choice oh fuck around and find out sure uh closer no do i come continue to come back to it yes why does it need to be translated i don't know uh all right i don't know <laughs> all right so say it in english doesn't everyone understand all right, so author says, but this, as we've seen, is implausible. Second, given that there is a minimal condition on acting permissibly, that one has good reason to believe the conditions that make your actions permissible are met, they also entail that we can never permissibly intervene, intervene in a transformative choice. Since we can, these views are false. Yeah, so they're basically saying, look, we can, but like the idea that like just because we don't know, these can't be right. Oh, you're translating it into Latin. <laughs> Make it sound fancy. Okay. Yeah. Okay, so what happened here was actually kind of interesting. You're saying, look, based on these arguments, it says you can't ever fuck around in someone's life because when they're making a decision because you don't know what's going to happen. But obviously that's wrong, so we have to figure out why. All right. Author says, answering the question of whether we're allowed to fuck around someone's life, I suggest requiring recognizing that the above views face their objections precisely because they concern transformative experiences. Due to the epistemic barrier between the time before and time after a transformative choice, views that depend on the valence of a transformative experience, best interests of someone, or expected utilities are unable to provide plausible accounts of when we may permissibly interfere in transformative choices. This provides some adequacy conditions on the answer to the question. First, the permissibility of interference should not be taken to depend on knowing the valence of the relevant experience. Second, it should avoid leaving an open question to whom some relevant moral obligation is owed between the present or future person. Third, it should not depend upon our knowing the unknowable the unknowable interest of nor the consequences of choices on some future person. Yeah, I mean, basically, there's a lot of inf we always act under incomplete information. 
always we act under incomplete in information. And so the idea that we need all this information to act is just misguided. Now they're outlining some ways we have to understand the information we don't know, but still, this is I'm finding this a little bit um misguided because we never have complete information. And so the idea that we can give advice, well, we give advice under complete information always. Viper says, have they touched on the objective or subjective truths? The advisor telling the advisee not to jump off the Empire State Building is different than don't drink because I'm an alcoholic. No, they haven't. Um, well, actually, they did kind of. They did kind of. They said, look, just because I have an experience doesn't mean you're going to have the same experience. And so that does... Um, like they were saying, like when the author holds a baby is different from maybe when his friend holds a baby. And so something different will happen between the two of them. So they did talk about that. And they did also say you shouldn't go on a killing spree. So there's a they didn't touch on it uh, explicitly, but they did. Um, they did touch on that. So, yeah, they, they it is the author is aware. <coughs> OK. The author says, I suggest that it is highly plausible that we have revelatory autonomy, the moral right to autonomously decide to discover how one's life will go and who they will become by making a transformative choice. Yeah, so you have the right to fuck around and find out. So, like, that's literally um, the thing here. Like, this is it. The right to fuck around and find out. It's like, you know what? I'm even going to write that down. find out so yeah do you have the right to find out that's what it says all right so this is a right to autonomously decide for ourselves whether to discover that what our lives will be like and who we will become after making a transformative choice. Importantly, this is not just a right to autonomy. That right raises similar questions as the views we've already considered, such as whether others should act so as to respect the autonomy of the present person or their future self, which may conflict. Instead, it is a right to make specific autonomous choices we are confronted with at a given time to have revealed to us through making a transformative choice, who we will become. Insofar as a future version of oneself has such a right, that right concerns only the transformative choices they may face in the future. All right, so this is the thing. You have the right to make a choice that will mess up your life or change it in a very significant way. This still doesn't tell you whether or not you can interfere in someone else's life, though. Yes, you have that right to make those decisions, but you can also get information from other people and may even want that information. Author asks, but what one might object is so morally important about making a free choice. Perhaps there is nothing specifically morally valuable about being allowed to make a free choice in general. As Onora O'Neill puts it, that mere sheer independence or choosing is morally important. If so, then why think that there is such moral value to autonomously making transformative choices that we have a moral right to do so? Yeah, this is getting weird at this point. The answer the author suggests is the moral value of autonomous self-making. It is not the value of making a choice as such, but rather of autonomously making choices to learn what our core preferences and values will become. So they think that you you autonomously make choices to learn what your core values and preferences will become. Who ever made a choice in a vacuum? Does anyone ever make a choice in a complete vacuum? I don't think so, author says, though. For autonomously making transformative choices when facing them, deciding for ourselves to learn who we will become gives us a degree of self-authorship, a degree of control that is over not necessarily who we become since we do not know this given the nature of transformative experiences, but over choosing ourselves to learn who we will become through a choice we make. Yes, astronauts, you're right, but there's very few of those. So this only applies to everyone on the, uh, not in space. Only people on Earth. That's a good, helpful correction, uh, Vipers. Shane says, I think that's a valid question, though. Being able to make a choice that has weight is important in just the act of deciding, regardless of the decision made. Knowing that you have the power to make that choice is important. I don't disagree. But, like, yeah, it is a good point. The point is we still don't make that, um, you know, 
outside of the rest of the world. We take the world into consideration and other people are part of the world. It's not like other people aren't in the world. And it's like, yes, of course, it's an important thing to find out what we want to do, who you want to be and what you want to make of yourself and find out. But <laughs> you aren't by yourself. The world exists and you have to take that into account. And people are part of that world. Yeah. Author says, and some degree of self-authorship in this sense is crucial for us and others to see ourselves as ourselves, selves we have become at least partly through transformative choices we have made. It is the value of autonomously self-making that grounds the right to a revelatory autonomy. It's like, yeah, you get to make choices. Who doubted that you get to make choices? No one is taking. No one said we were going to take away your agency here. But talking to people is not taking away their agency either. All right. Author says, such a right generates this correlative duty, relative revelatory non-interference. The moral duty not to interfere in the autonomous self-making of others through their choosing to undergo transformative experiences to discover who they will become. Yeah, and so this sounds very good, but I completely disagree that like we have to completely lay our hands off. For the most of the time... Um, yeah, well, that's, we like having alternate, uh, you know, the philosophy way we're looking at this, Shane, is fine. It's one perspective. The sociology way is another way. That is also good. Smart people over there can say important things. But like I was just saying, you have a right to, like, you know, make decisions in your life and have them matter to you. You don't get to ignore everything else in the world while you're doing it. That's stupid. <laughs> okay. Author says, together these suggest that it is permissible to interfere in the transformative choices of others only if their right to revelatory autonomy is outweighed. Yes, yeah, so, okay. If they're deciding to, like, shoot up a school, then it is obviously outweighed. Like, so they're trying to go for a baseline here. That's fine, too. Author suggests further that if someone's right to revelatory autonomy is outweighed and our duty of non-interference no longer binds us, then it is permissible to interfere to try to prevent another from making some transformative choice. Yeah, so like this is a minimal baseline, which I think is a little too minimal, but that's fine. Vipers ask, is, mista is making mistakes an essential part of learning or can all wisdom be received? Um... I very much doubt that all wisdom can be received. The idea that I can tell you all the things, like, I don't think that makes sense. So you're going to have to find out sometimes. Um, if anything, I can say that, like, some things are have to be embodied. Like, you're, I'm not going to be able to tell you how to, like, operate your body. Like, um, it's an old thing, but, like, explaining, like, mechanical uh, things that, like, me explaining how to use the scissors to you will not work. You have to find out how it is to, you know, like, use the scissors vipers. I assume you can use the scissors. Um, so like things like that. So making like you have to just try sometimes and that is going to include making mistakes. So from that perspective, there is, there is no way that I can tell you all the things that you would need to know in this life. Shane says, but society can simply by existing make some people feel like they have no autonomy. Shane says, I don't think all types of wisdom can be received. and I don't think that everyone is as capable of receiving wisdom. Um... Viper says, I can use scissors. I don't go for a run without them. Good. We'll see. That's a thing. Um, so there is wisdom you have still to get about scissors and running, but like you can use them, which means you actually know how to like, you know, manipulate a mechanical devices of such. And like, like I said, try to describe how to tell someone what to do. And it's a uh, very hard. Um, and so, yeah, that's just an uh, old little philosophy argument there that shows that there's a limit to what we can talk about. Um, but this is a good question by Shane. When a society or like people make someone feel like they have no autonomy, like you can, you know, beat someone down psychologically so far that they can't feel, they feel like they can't make a decision anymore. Um, what about then? Yeah, I think that would be the opposite like the opposite case from what the author's saying here they're like the flip side of it they're saying look when you have obvious reasons that they have to um their autonomy is outweighed 
but like this is where you have to give it back to them people need to have the autonomy to begin with and so if you assume from uh the what was it up here that you have to have revelatory autonomy um that you have a right to this then yeah i think you, people need to be given that and until they have that then we've done them an injustice and so people have a right to be able to make decisions on their own and so yeah we have a right to interfere with them but that assumes that they already have it and so i, I agree with you but like it's like this the author hasn't talked about that but i think it's kind of assumed that anyone we are dealing with in this case already has more autonomy than um like it, the limited case where they don't like we were we're assuming that they have it in some sense Shane says, hypothetically, overbearing parent raises their child without choice in most matters. Later in life, adult child goes to parent for advice. When parent gives advice, child feels like they have no choice because of conditioning. Yeah, yeah, I think you're just on delay. You put that, you said that right as soon as I was saying my same thing. Um, that's the thing. We need a baseline of um, non-conditioned like autonomy. And how we get that back is a very hard question. How do you undo that sort of conditioning? I don't know. You need probably more psych training than I have. Um, yeah, I don't know. But, like, that's the thing. We need to already uh, put those cases aside, I think, in this in this instance, where you're saying, look, the person has enough of a baseline of autonomy. They're not just listening blindly to, um, you know, some authority figure. Okay. But, like, the author here is still establishing a baseline. Viper says, I'm guessing the conclusion of this paper, like so many before in Philosophy Roulette, will be kind of depends. I don't have any real conclusions. Uh, yeah, well, the, yeah, you, well, you're right on average, and you're right in most likely the case. That's what's going to be here. This person actually, from a rhetorical standpoint, looks like they're trying to dress it up a little bit more, to tell you the truth, because they want to be able to say this right here. That we have a moral duty not to interfere in the autonomous self-making of others through their choosing to undergo transformative experiences. So they're going to grandstand is what's going to happen, saying that this is uh, important right here. This relative relev revelatory non-interference. Um, so they're going to grandstand. It's going to come out what you're saying, but they're going to grandstand. Hey, Mr. Partyardi, how you doing? Hope you're well. Um, Shane says, I think your statement about how no one makes a decision in a vacuum is super accurate. I mean, Pakshe, Vipers, astronauts. And I probably have a ton of ways you that you don't mean, but it's all good. We are in agreement. I'm just quibbling. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, I think, yeah. Uh, there are ways people are under control. But, like, that doesn't mean that everyone is always under control. So, yeah. Okay. So. What's the word tonight? We're talking about, do you have a right to fuck around and find out? Um, because this person's saying, look, how much can we interfere with other people's? Um, and we thank Shane for that uh, locution there. Um, but, like, if someone's going to make a bad decision, can you, you know, attempt to stop them in, in various ways? And so mostly we're saying, look... You have a right to fuck. You have a right to find out on your own. But of course, you can go like if someone you know is gonna go make a decision, you can go tell them that you, it's a bad idea, and you think so, even if you are under low information because we don't have all the information. We never have all the information. This uh, the author here is taking a little bit of a hard line, saying you need more information. No, we never have all the information. We always have partial information, and uh, it's a little bit of a philosopher's a. Uh, you know, abstraction to say we're going to have all the information. We don't. All right. So they were talking about conditions under which you can go tell people it's a bad idea to do something. So um, basically, if someone is, you know, doing something very dumb and you know something that is very dumb, you can tell them. All right, so this conditional answer meets our adequacy conditions. For the grounds of permissibility, interfering need not depend upon the valence of the transformative experience, nor does it leave it open to whom the relevant duty is owed. For the right to revelatory autonomy, that is the fuck around find out part, is a right of the present person and does not concern the interest the interest or expected utility of some, f of some decision for a future person who does not face this choice. We thus also need not know anything about future interests or consequences to answer. 
Moreover, first, my answer explains how and why there are there are cases where it is morally permissible to interfere in another's transformative choice, despite the epistemic barrier surrounding the transformative experiences. Take the would-be killer. I suggest that their right to revelatory autonomy is plausibly outweighed by the wrongness of the killing of others due to the due to discover done to discover who one would be by doing so. Wow, this is crashing a lot. Interesting. Why do you keep crashing on me? And with our would-be self-mutilator, the strength of the moral reasons to protect one's friends from gratuitous harm plausibly outweighs their right to autonomously discover what it would be like to and who they would become by irre irreversibly harming themselves solely to discover this. Our corresponding duty of non-interference is then pro tanto. It can be outweighed by competing moral considerations. By making the permissibility of interference depend upon knowledge we cannot possess prior to the making of a transformative choice, the other views considered cannot explain this. Okay, so basically if you have a really good moral decision, then you can say, okay, don't do that. Um, I think that's a too high a bar myself, but you know what? Whatever. That's okay. Um, but that's what the author wants to say. That means they have their... Uh, that like vipers that's their big thing uh, they argued that they said this is when you can override someone's autonomy okay second it seems plausible that some cases of interference and transformative choices are easier to justify than others for example what must obtain for it to be permissible to interfere in someone's choice to eat a cheeseburger for the first time seems much less demanding than interfering in their choosing to go to university uh, Shane says, I guess they're assuming a universal moral constant. Yeah, you can see that in the way they're arguing um, for uh, the rational decisions. That's uh, something you can add up and you can just, you know, you can add up goods and bads in terms of moral stuff. So this person is generally arguing in a somewhat um, em empiricist, uh, consequentialist uh, viewpoint that you can just sort of look at it and know. Um, yeah, that's right. Okay. Author's view is this, since the value of the right to revelatory autonomy is grounded in the value of autonomous self-making, you can see they're always talking about value too, which uh, you would be talking about obligation if it was in a uh, Kantian sort of uh, deontological view, but this is like you can add all this stuff up, What what's the total good, the value of autonomous self-making, some transformative choices will be morally more morally valuable than others. Which? Question mark. Those that are the most likely to affect your own core preferences, identity, and values. As going to university is more likely to affect these than eating a cheeseburger for the first time, the strength of the moral reasons for interference must be much greater for the former than those reasons that would justify interfering in the latter. Um, yeah, I guess so. I mean, this... As you're saying, there's like a universal moral constant. This is a lot of hand waving here. They're saying, "Hey, look, you." This is where I think Vipers was getting annoyed. This is the hand waving. You have to just look at it. Like, okay, you have to sort of figure out how important is this, and then how strongly do I feel about it? Yeah. <sighs> Transformative experiences and the right to revelatory autonomy, or what happens when Flossers watch The Empire Strikes Back? <laughs> oh wow, that was a pretty big flaw there. Um, yeah, this is where things break down. <laughs> Which choices will be more morally valuable? And that deals with my values. Yeah, it is on, in some sense. Um, they're asking when are you allowed to do it or when do you, relative to what you know when when are you allowed to make such morally permissible choices so it's not entirely terrible what they said because you have you're deciding for yourself not universally even though they're in a universal framework you have to still make the sort of decision for yourself um so that's not terrible it's just not good either um there is no this is what i was saying with vipers is me like well you're gonna have to weigh all the stuff and it'll be like more of someone like half of a half dozen of one six of the other it's like that's this is the point of the article we're getting to because we're getting to the end right here. Like, right here. So. <coughs> Alright. Like I said, it's not great, but it's not terrible like what they just said. Like I said, it's, uh, you're deciding for yourself here when is it morally permissible to interfere with someone else. But like, again, this has always been the case. 
you interfere when you think it's a good idea. That's all they said right there. That's it. All right. Author says, one might worry, however, that whilst it seems plausible that coercion, manipulation, and force can, in principle, violate an agent's right to revelatory autonomy, rational persuasion cannot. Rather, rational persuasion always respects an agent's right right to make an autonomous decision of any kind. It involves offering reasons, evidence, and arguments, and aims to promote, at least not undermine, rational decision-making. Since rational persuasion is the form of interference most likely to be pursued in the cases I've used to motivate this paper, we might worry that this leaves the general framework I've offered troubled. But distinguishing between A, respecting moral autonomy, simpliciter in the sense of respecting someone's ability to make a competent capable to be a competent, capable reasoner, and B, respecting one's revelatory autonomy, that is, their right to make a specific decision at a given time to learn who they will become through a self-making transformative choice. Rational persuasion does respect an agent's ability to be a competent, capable reasoner, but doing the former does not entail respecting an agent's autonomy, autonomous self-authorship. Yeah, I mean, they were saying this whole time that any molestation of another person is uh, grounds to like say, look, you're not allowed to do that. They've been kind of absolutist about that, that you can't, uh, like if someone's making a big choice, you have to leave them be. That's been the whole point of this paper, as long as it's, you know, like they're not going on a killing spree or like cutting their own leg off for shits and giggles. If they're cutting their own legs or like themselves off at the waist for shits and giggles, you can tell them, you know, maybe that's a bad idea. But like they're saying anything else, you have to like be silent. I don't buy this quietism like at all. All right. For example, one can treat someone in a way that respects their autonomy as a rational agent whilst failing to accord them the epistemic autonomy which they should be granted when ma facing self-making decisions. That an agent should be given the opportunity to deliberate on transformative choices for themselves is motivated by the value of self-making, the importance of making decisions for ourselves. But, for example, one can, as George Tsai argues, offer a rational argument against a choice at a time or in a way that prevents an agent from exercising such epistemic autonomy, offering it, for example, too early or too forcefully in an agent's deliberative process. More Moreover, recall that we are considering rational persuasion in the context of transformative choices. Another way one can respect an agent's autonomy simpliciter whilst violating their right to revelatory autonomy is by trying to offer apparent reasons, arguments, or evidence as if one is in an epistemically privileged position with respect to what some choices would be like for an agent. That would constitute a distinctive disrespect of an agent's autonomous self-making whilst respecting their capacity for autonomous reflection. Even rational persuasion then can disrespect an agent's right to revelatory autonomy. All right, right here. I think they, this is where I, one of the places I give, I think um, the author has a problem. What is someone's capacity for autonomous self-reflection? There are idiots out there. There are ignoramuses out there. Their capacity for autonomous self-reflection is limited because they don't know what the fuck they're talking about. And they should have more information. Even if they're making something that is one of these uh, big decisions and that we, you don't know how, they're, um, how anything is going to turn out, they may be acting on such little information that it is an affront to rational thought that they're making this sort of decision all right so one of the guys at work yeah i mean but like this is the thing you the fact that you could tell them that you're being a dumb fuck and they may be being a dumb fuck the idea that you can't tell someone they're being a dumb fuck is stupid so guy i work with he had a kid when he was 17 16 18 somewhere around there and he, you know he was living on his own at the time and uh, with his uh, now wife. And, uh, you know, they're at the hospital. And the birth goes um, fine. And, you know, they're in the hospital and then they're leaving the hospital. And, you know, doctors go, here's your kid. Uh, you know, best of luck to you. And so he's standing there holding his newborn daughter in his hands with like his wife in like a wheelchair or something. And he's thinking, what the fuck just happened? Like, I'm not responsible enough to have this kid. Like, seriously, he's like, why the fuck did they just like, he's like, no, 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 you can't just kick me out the hospital door. Like, what are you doing? Like, are you crazy? I can't have this kid. It's like, yes, 
people didn't tell him like he did not realize what he was doing at the time because he like he kind of thought he did but he had no idea and then he realized he got there he had no idea what he was doing that's like did someone not tell him he was being a dumb fuck ahead of time maybe they didn't he probably maybe not i forget like who he was dealing with at that time but it's like you can tell people this because they don't have the full capacity for autonomous reflection yes you're violating their capacity for autonomous reflection because it was deficient to begin with you have a right to get people into a better decision making spot all right now it may be that you don't know how things are going to work out but if they're not even in the right frame uh mindset like frame of mind for making such a decision, then yes, clearly you should be able to do something. And so are you disrespecting their decision to make, uh, their right to make a decision? This is what happens with kids all the time. They're like, I'm I'm a person, I know what I'm doing, I'm rational. It's like, no, you fucking don't, kid. You need to learn a lot more shit before you make a fucking dumbass decision. This happens all the time, and the idea that you can't do that is like clearly wrong. <laughs> it's like, it's just obviously wrong. Because like, when do you make, yeah, very simple when do you make the cutoff between a kid and adult when they get to to allow them to make uh decisions when do you do it pick a number this author can pick any number and it's going to be wrong in some cases any number so it's like that's going to be wrong in a lot more cases a lot fewer cases but any number and the idea that you can't do that tell the kid that they're being a dumb fuck is like no the kids are dumb fucks that's why we have rules and laws for kids that are different from adults and like this is not a controversial uh point all right, let's just finish up. This is a conclusion right here. <coughs> and sometimes kids do have to fuck around and find out, just like everyone else. All right, conclusion. Ethical questions regarding transformative experiences are morally urgent. A complete answer to our question requires ascertaining precisely how strong the right to revelatory autonomy is and what competing considerations can outweigh it. And here is uh, what Vipers was complaining about earlier. Here's the Hegden. These are questions for another time, when the moral significance of the revelation and self-making, the competing way, weight of moral and non-moral considerations, and the sense in which some transformative choices are more significant to one's identity and self-making than others must be further explored. Now, you're right. It was coming, but like they put this here because now what they're going to say is what I'm going to say. But I did say something. Hey, and it starts off with but. But to identify the right to revelatory autonomy and duty of revelatory non-interference is significant progress, for it provides a framework to address the ethics of transformative experiences that avoids complications arising from the epistemic peculiarities of transformative experiences. It also allows us to explain cases where we are permitted to interfere in another's transformative choice and why interference in why interference in some choices is harder to justify than others whilst recognizing plausible grounds. Alright, this is the fucking fourth time he's written wall whilst. Like, seriously, dude? <laughs> you would be. Uh, vipers, you'd fit right in. They're all unbearable. Whilst recognizing plausible grounds for the right to revelatory autonomy itself in the moral value of autonomous self making. This framework, moreover, opens novel avenues of engagement with wider ethical issues regarding transformative experience, for example, concerning social justice or surrogate transformative choice making. It is, at the very least, a view worthy of further consideration. <laughs> yeah, Shane used to be unbearable in academia. He still is, too. <laughs> okay. Now that we've ragged on this paper quite a bit, all concerning, it's really not even that bad of a paper. Like, um, that they made a baseline, what I was saying, that they, you know, established themselves a little baseline right up here. That is you know i guess something of worth and as far as philosophy goes they say look you can tell someone they're wrong when they're wrong and they're arguing based on transformative experiences there is even in some stuff where we have no knowledge of the future or we have like extremely good reason to believe that we can still on moral grounds take away someone's autonomy and so even in like some very edge cases and that for a philosophy paper, like, you know, that's what all that you can basically hope for a lot of times. Um, so like, that's it. But yeah, this is the thing. That's all they did. And in the end, you get the hedging and then you get them saying, hey, look, but I established a baseline. And that's um, nice. Now, why did this get published? Because it's a 
the one thing that they did do is they switched the perspective from the first person to the uh, second or third person. What can we tell someone else? This is the second person perspective when they're making a transformative choice. In this literature, which is admittedly a little bit hot in the last few years, the idea that we're shifting perspective here, you know, good on the author, kind of clever, and it deserves um, a little kudos there. Jane says, I think they tried to argue too hard. A lot of the points created oppositional straw men as a way to make the points appear stronger than it is. Um, yeah, you know, <laughs> philosophy is a lot of people trying very hard um, to make themselves sound, uh, their arguments sound more impressive than they are. Um, yeah, but yeah I, I agree you know it just I, I flat out agree but I find that you know what I want to say is that a lot of philosophy is that way people are building up a not very good idea to make it sound like you know they've done more than they have like I said this one the they did two things they um switched perspective on a topic that has been generally from the first person perspective and that's nice. And then how do you build a paper around there? Well, then they tried to, you know, build it up to say that they um, then got like, you know, this little like, um, like the, this, like this is here me complaining. They're only asking human questions, nothing special, but then they got their baseline. So that's what I think they did. They had one good idea about switching the perspective and then like, what are other people's obligations in these situations to someone undergoing a transformative experience? And then how do you analyze it again? This was just a human, like the, a very human point, nothing special there. And then they, you know, they made a baseline, which is, uh, that's it. And that's fine. Okay. Do we have any other questions, comments on this? I don't have much more to say. Like I said, it, it has an idea or two about it. If you're going to have a transformative experience, what does someone else have to say about it in your life? 